So today we're going to look at section 6.4, the Gram-Schmidt process. Uh, and as I mentioned at the end of the last section, our whole goal here is to take, so if I have a set of vectors which I know a span a subspace W, so let's call these vectors uh, V1, V2, through Vn. So W is a span of these things, and let's say that these things are in fact a basis. All right, so a basis for W. So they're linearly independent. Right, so we've got a basis for W. Our goal is to find an orthogonal basis for W. All right, so we want to uh, we're, if we have a basis to start with, the vectors may not be perpendicular, so we need to adjust these vectors so that they, they become perpendicular to one another, but they still span the same thing. But that's our goal. The reason that we want to do that is so that we can do everything that we did in the last section, project onto a subspace, uh, find all of these other related things. Uh, in order to do that, it was required that the basis that we had was an orthogonal basis. So that's what we need to do. And we're going to start out in the simplest case and build up from there. And the simple case is actually not that bad. We're going to start with just two vectors, uh, v1 and v2, and say that w is the span of these two vectors. And then ask, what can we do uh, to make two vectors which are perpendicular but still span the same thing. And the idea is to use our projection from last time. So this down here, this vector in this direction, would be the projection of V2 onto V1. But remember what this one is. Right? Since we have V2, we need to make V2 out of this. This is actually V2 minus that projection. So if I had Notice that those are perpendicular. So if I had v1 and this vector, then what we have is two vectors which are perpendicular to each other, but still span the same plane. So our, our idea is to let u1 just be v1, the starting vector, and u2 be this, this, uh, this subtraction, v2 minus the projection of v2 onto v1. And by doing so, we now have an orthogonal set, because these things are perpendicular. Here's the first and here's the second. And they still span the same thing. And so let's apply that to a, an example, and then we'll move on to where we have more than just two vectors to start. Suppose that W is the span of 1 minus 1, 2, and 3, 2, 0. These vectors are not perpendicular because when I dot them, I get 3 minus 2 plus 0, which is 1. So their dot product is not 0, so they're not perpendicular. And so our goal is to find an orthogonal basis. Or W. And just applying the thinking from just a minute ago, we're going to let U1 be V1, if we call this V1 and this V2 which is just 1 minus 1, 2. We're going to let u2 be, uh, from our discussion just a minute ago, v2 minus the projection of v2 onto v1. Which will work out is 3, 2, 0, minus. When I project v2 onto v1, I dot them together, and I get 3 minus 2 plus 0 divided by, uh, since I'm projecting onto V1, it's V1 dot itself, which is 1 plus 1 plus 4, all times V1, projecting onto V1. So 1 minus 1, 2. And then we can just simplify this. This becomes 3, 2, 0 minus 1 over 6, 1 minus 1, 2, which is 3, 2, 0 minus, 
one sixth, no, minus one sixth, and two sixths, which is one third. Which is, so when I subtract, that's 18 six minus one six, which is 17 sixths. Uh, 12 plus one is 13 sixths. And then zero minus one third is minus one third. So this was our U1, and this is our U2. So the answer to the question is, U1 is our starting V1, and U2 is this vector here. 17 sixths, 13 sixths, minus 1 third. And now I have two vectors which are perpendicular. Notice if you dot them together, what happens? I get 17 sixths. I get minus 13 six, that's four sixths, but then when I put this in here, I get minus two thirds, which is minus four sixths, and when I add them together, I get zero. U1 dot U2 is in fact zero as required. Because of the way U2 is created, it, uh, the span of U1 and U2 is the same as the span of V1 and V2, and so this is my answer. W is span of U1 and U2. Now, uh, for the future, sometimes these fractions are going to be a little bit tricky. And sometimes what we're going to want to do is actually get rid of any fractions. Notice that I, I could scale U2, and it doesn't change the fact that W is still the span of U1 and U2. So if I had U1 and U2, and then I had U1 and 3 U2, they still span the same plane. So I can actually scale these. I can scale this to get rid of the fractions. So let's make an alternate U2. Um, uh, let's, so let's look at what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by 6, right? because that gets rid of all of these fractions. And I get 17, 13, uh, minus 2. And by doing so, I get rid of all of the fractions. And I can actually then say that, this, that W is, in fact, the span of these two vectors. 1 minus 1, 2, 17, 13, minus 2. And I have nicer vectors to work with, which don't have any fractions. They still are perpendicular, because I get 17 minus 13 minus 4, which is 0. So that's my favorite answer to this question. Now, what to do if we have three vectors? Once we figure that out, moving on to 4 or 10 is actually the same. These get kind of complicated just uh, as far as calculation-wise, but the idea is actually not that hard. Right, so here's our idea if I have three vectors. Suppose that I have, uh, suppose that W is the span of now three different vectors, V1, V2, V3. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let U1 be V1, just as before. I'm going to fix V1. I'm going to let U2 be the same thing as we just looked at. Right, so I'm going to project V2. I'm going to take V2 minus the projection of V2 onto V1. Same thing as before. And now I have two vectors. So I have these two vectors that uh, are now uh, perpendicular to each other. And I just have one more that's, uh, that's pointing in the wrong direction. So now we can think about u1 and u2 as being perpendicular. And then I have some other vector v, which is pointing off in the wrong direction. And so the goal is to take this one and adjust it. But our idea from last time works. Now I can instead project, look at this vector right here, by, by projecting v onto the whole subspace spanned by u1 and u2 and then subtracting that projection off. Let me just write down what we get. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, this was our V3, I'm going to take V3 minus, this is very analogous to before, the projection of V3 onto what? Well, everything that came before, which is U1 and U2. So this is now the, the span of U1 and U2. Right, so that's this picture over here. If we had four vectors, well, then we'd go on. I'd say U4, 
is V4 minus the projection of V4 onto the, uh, it will be V4 minus the projection of V4 onto the span of the stuff that came before, U1, U2, and U3. And so, so it may be tricky to see what's going on uh, from all of this, but let's just work out some examples and, and hopefully that will clarify. Okay. All right, so suppose W is span minus 1, 1, 0, 2, 3, 2, uh, 1, 2, and 0, minus 1, minus 1, 4. So this is our V1, V2, V3. And again, let's find an orthogonal basis for W. So our idea is to say that U1 is V1, which is minus 1, 1, 0, 2. U2 is going to be V2 minus the projection of V2 onto uh, V1, or U1, they're the same thing. Which in this case is, so V2 is 3, 2, 1, 2, minus, if I project V2 onto V1, I'm looking at V2 dot V1, that's negative 3 plus 2 plus 0 plus 4, all over v1 dot v1, which is 1 plus 1 plus 4, all times v1, which is minus 1, 1, 0, 2. And this becomes 3, 2, 1, 2, minus, so that's uh, 6 minus 3, which is 3, over 6, minus 1, 1, 0, 2. So that's minus 1 half. But when I put it inside, it makes a minus 1 half. That makes 1 half, 0, and then 1. So when I simplify, that becomes plus. So 3 plus 1 half, that's 6 halves. Plus 1 half is 7 halves. That is now minus, which is 3 halves. 1 minus 0 is still 1. And then 2 minus 1 is, is still 1. So this is our vector u2. But just as before, if we stuck with this, well, then the next step would get really tricky because we'd have all these fractions, which are um, a hassle to deal with. So in order to get rid of fractions, I'm going to clear out the denominators by scaling this by 2. If I scale this by 2, this becomes 7, 3, 2, 2. Notice that this vector, dot u1, is 0. I get negative 7, 3, 0, and 4. So those two dot together is 0. And again, uh, by the construction technique, I haven't changed the span. So now I've got u1 and I've got u2. So let's save those two things. So u1 is v1, minus 1, 1, 0, 2. u2 is this vector that we constructed here, 7, 3, 2, 2. Finally, I need to adjust V3. I do that by saying U3 is V3 minus the projection of V3 onto the previous uh, orthogonal stuff that we've calculated, onto the span of U1 and U2, which is V3 minus projection of V3 onto U1 plus the projection of V3 onto U2. And in the end, that's what we're going to do. Even if we had a longer version, if we had four or six vectors, then we do exactly the same thing as we move up. Each step, it gets longer and longer and longer, which is why these things can take a while to get through. But we saved ourselves a bunch of work by scaling this vector right here.
Okay, so um, finally, how are we going to work this out? V3 is 0 minus 1 minus 1, 4. The projection of V3 onto U1. So now I got V3 and I got U1, so I dot both together and I get 0. I get minus 1, I get 0, and I get 8 all over U1 dot itself which is 1 plus 1 plus 4, all times u1, plus v3 and u2, which makes 0, minus 3, minus 2, plus 8, when I dot those together, all over u2 dot itself, which is 49, plus 9, plus 4, plus 4. Notice what would have happened if we had fractions here. This would have been really complicated. This would have been pretty complicated, too, with fractions. So I, the reason that we scaled up U2 to get rid of fractions was so that this calculation becomes a lot easier. And then we still have to multiply by U2, which is 7, 3, 2, 2. And so then we just need to work out our calculations. I'm going to keep U1 and U2 here because that's what we want as part of our final answer. And we just need to simplify this, this. So this becomes 0 minus 1 minus 1, 4 minus, that's 7, and that's 6, minus 1, 1, 0, 2. And this is uh, 9 over... 1766. 7322. Alright, and just so that we don't make silly mistakes, I'm going to just put these into our calculator just to make sure that I get the right answers here. So this is uh, 0 minus 76, which makes plus 76 plus 9 divided by 66 times 7. So the first one is 70 over 33. And all I did was go straight across for the top entry. The second entry is negative 1 minus 7 sixths. Oh, careful. Oops, I made a mistake. This is a common mistake. Be careful with this. This minus distributes across both pieces. So this top one would actually be 0 minus, seven, minus negative 7, 6, but then minus 966 times 7. So this becomes 7 over 33, not 70 over 33, because of that minus sign. So 7 over 33. The second one, negative 1, now minus 7, 6, if I'm looking at the second entry, Minus 966 times 3. And that is negative 85 over 33. So these things are not pretty in the end. Right? So we get lots of messy uh, vectors out, but that's, that's okay. It gives us an orthogonal basis, which is what we want. The third entry is negative 1. Now, minus 0, and then minus 966 times 2. Is minus 14 elevenths. And the fourth entry is 4 minus 7, 6 times 2 minus 966 times 2. 46 over 33. Now, I'm making nice use of my calculators, convert to fraction function because it's going to give us answers in decimals, but if, by converting to fractions, uh, I can get these answers. And again, we can scale to make this a lot nicer. If we multiply everything by 33, this scales this up, and we have no fractions left. I get 7, negative 85. Multiply this by 33 makes this times 3, which is uh, 42, and then 46. And that's my U3. So the final answer to this question is u1 is, is this vector, u2 is this vector, and u3 is this vector.
And now we have an orthogonal basis for W. You can check if you would uh, any two pairs of these together, you will get zero. They are orthogonal. And by a fashion of the construction, they haven't changed the span. One last thing that I'll just mention here about, about this is it may ask you for, rather than an orthogonal basis, it may ask you for an orthonormal basis. Orthonormal. And what that means is that I want an orthogonal basis with unit vectors. But that we can just do simply by divide each of these vectors by the length. I can normalize each of these vectors by dividing by their length, and that turns them into unit vectors. And it will look messy, especially with something like this. If I take the length of this vector, it'll look very messy. But it's okay. We can just do it, and we get a square root with a big number underneath, and, and that's okay. All right, so uh, two last ideas in this section in 6.4. So we need to first think a little bit more about um, a matrix that is made up of orthonormal columns. So suppose that we had an orthogonal. Remember that this is our definition for an orthogonal matrix. And an orthogonal matrix is a matrix with columns that are orthogonal, but each is unit length. Right, so remember, so this was from last time or a few times ago. Uh, so A is orthogonal if and only if the columns of A are orthogonal as a set, but also unit vectors, so orthonormal. Okay, so let's, um, I want to point out something about these, something that's kind of special about these orthogonal matrix uh, matrices. So suppose that, so let's put this actually as a theorem. Theorem. And let's say, let's call it U, just to point out that it's something, a special matrix. If U is orthogonal, is an orthogonal matrix. And let's just start with a, a matrix with three columns, although it doesn't have to be three columns. It can actually be as long as we want, but the proof will be the same. So how about this? If U is orthogonal, an orthogonal matrix. then U transpose times U is the identity matrix. Here's our proof. Uh, let's say, for simplicity, let's let U just have three columns. But the proof is the same even if I don't have three columns, even if I have one or a thousand columns. So I have column one, column two, column three. Remember that for transpose, when I transpose a matrix, I switch the rows and columns. So that means that U transpose, if I have U1, which is a column, and I turn that into a row, I can think about U1 as a, as a matrix and transposing it to make U1 transpose. So that's my first row. U1 transpose is now my, is my first row. Uh, U2 transpose is my second row. And U3 transpose is my third row. So now I'm thinking about a matrix which, which is created out of rows rather than columns that we started with. So that U transpose times U is U1 transpose, U2 transpose, U3 transpose, times U1, U2, U3. The matrix is in terms of rows and columns. Multiplication works just like vectors. Uh, if, I, if I multiply these, let's see what we get, right? So let's think about what we get. If I take U1 transpose, 
times. So think about the, what we're going to get as a matrix in the end. The first entry will be the first row times the first column, which is U1 transpose dot U1. Because that's the first row, and that's the first column. So U1 transpose dot U1. What happens next? Well, the next one will be the first row times the second column. So let's make a little bit of space. So that's U1 transpose dot U2. And then U1 transpose dot U3. If I move uh, next, I'll have U2 transpose dot U1. U2 transpose dot U2. U2 transpose dot U3. And then finally U3 transpose dot U1. And similarly, as we move. Finally, since the matrix that we started with was an orthogonal matrix, that meant that different columns dotted to zero. So that is that U1, so then we're thinking about U1 as a, as a when I say transpose, that just meant turn the column into a row, which makes sense for these dot products. But U1 dot U2 is zero because it was an orthogonal matrix. Right? So this is zero. This is zero because U1 and U3 are zero. Zero, 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 zero. zero. The only things that are not zero are on the diagonal because this is not two different columns. This is U1 and U1, U2 and U2, U2 and U2. And so all of those things are zero, but notice that u1 transpose dot u1, well, that's the same thing as the length of u1. Because the length of u1, that's actually the length uh, squared, right? So the, the length squared of a vector is the same thing as the dot product of the vector with itself. Uh, because the length is the square root of the sum of the, of the components multiplied together. But since this was an orthogonal matrix, the columns were unit vectors, which means that the length of U1 is 1 squared, which means that U1 transpose dot U1 is 1. And so what I get, and similarly for these other things, and so what I get is 1s on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, which is great. Uh, that's, that's what we want. That was our theorem. And again, a 4x4 four four or 10x10 10 is really exactly the same proof. But what does that mean for us? That means that if I have an orthogonal matrix, if A is orthogonal, that is, has orthogonal columns and unit vectors, then A transpose A is the identity, which tells me that the inverse of A is, in fact, A transpose, because A inverse times A is also the identity. All right, so that's, that's one interesting thing about uh, orthogonal matrices. And we're going to use these facts for what's called a QR factorization. Okay. Write it out as a theorem, and then we'll practice it. And it goes like this. For any matrix A, I can write A as a product of two matrices, Q and R, where Q is an orthogonal matrix um, which spans the same thing as the column space of A. Right, so Q is orthogonal, and the, co uh, the column space of A is the same thing as the column space of Q. That's the first thing. So notice what I'm really doing. I, I can apply Gram-Schmidt to get Q, right? If I have A, then I have column vectors. If I want to span the same thing and be orthogonal, well, then I can apply Gram-Schmidt. And then I have to normalize at the end to make everything a unit vector. But that's the, that's the first idea. That's how I'm going to get Q. And in fact, R, we'll find, is going to be upper triangular. 
So that is that it has entries on the diagonal and above, but nothing below the diagonal. And also we can be a little bit uh, more specific, more precise. The entries on the diagonal are going to be positive. Okay, so that's how that's our theorem. I'm not going to give a full proof. I'll give a, a few ideas and then we'll and we'll practice it. Um, so the idea here is that Q we obtain Q by the Gram Schmidt on the column vectors of A. So if I take the column vectors of A that we started with, those are vectors which uh, are not necessarily orthogonal. We apply Gram-Schmidt to get an orthogonal basis for the same set, right, for the same uh, for the same subspace, and that's where we get Q from. Then how am I going to get R? Well, R is just according to this A times Q inverse. But if Q is an orthogonal matrix, and that's what it is, then Q inverse is Q transpose by our previous uh, by our previous thinking. So R will just be A times Q transpose. And so let's practice. Let's, here's the matrix A. Let's find a QR factorization. And so what that means is find our Q and R as before. So we need to apply the entire grand schmidt process on these vectors. So this will be V1, V2, V3. So that U1 is V1 as before. 3, 1, minus 1, 3. U2 is V2 minus the projection of V2 onto V1, which is 5 minus 5, 1, 5 minus 7, minus project V2 onto V1. So dot these together, and I get minus 15, plus 1, minus 5, minus 21, all over the dot of V1 with itself which is 9 plus 1 plus 1 plus 9, all times V2. Sorry, made a mistake. We're projecting onto V1, all, so all times V1, all right, so, which is 3, 1, minus 1, 3. So minus 5, 1, 5, 7, minus, I put these together, I get, uh, that's negative 20, that's negative uh, 19, minus 21, 21 is negative 40, put these together, and I get 20. All times 3, 1 minus 1, 3, so that's minus 5, 1, 5, minus 7, that makes plus 2 times this, which is 6, 2, minus 2, 6. Add these together, makes 1, 3, 3, minus 1. And so we're in luck here. Uh, these numbers worked out very nicely. We don't have any fractions here, so we don't have to scale it up. So now we have U1, and now we have U2. And then we need to calculate U3. And U3 is the projection, is V3 minus the projection of V3 on the U1 plus the projection of V3 onto U2. Right, so we're taking V3, and we're projecting it onto the previous two, but not the previous two original, 
the previous two after we've made them orthogonal. Which is 1, 1 minus 2, 8, minus, when I take V3 and U1, the dot product of those two is 3 plus 1 plus 3, sorry, plus a, so 3, 1, 2, and then 24. All over V1 dot itself, which is 9 plus 1 plus 1 plus 9. All times U1, 3, 1, minus 1, 3. Don't forget your parentheses. And then V3 onto U2. V3 onto U2 is over here. Dot product makes 1, 3, minus 6, minus 8 over U2 dot itself. 1, 9, 9, 1. All times U2. 1, 3, 3, minus 1. And we want to simplify this. We simplify this. 1, 1, minus 2, 8, minus 26, 27, 30, over 20 is 3 halves, times 3, 1, minus 1, 3. That's minus 14. And then 4 is minus 10 over 10 over 20 is minus 1 half. 1, 3, 3, minus 1. And so if we work this out piece by piece inside here on the top entry, 3 halves times 3 is 9 halves. Minus 1 half is 8 halves, which is 4. 1 minus 4 is negative 3. On the second entry, I have 3 halves minus 3 halves, which is 0, and 1 minus 0 is 1. The third entry is negative 3 halves minus 3 halves, which is uh, minus 6 halves, which is negative 3. I had negative 2 minus negative 3, which is plus 3, which is 1. And finally, uh, inside for the last entry, uh, we have 9 halves, and then we have minus minus one half, which is plus one half, which is five halves. So, um, sorry, we have nine halves plus another one half, ten halves, which makes five. Eight minus five is three. So this is our U3 vector, and U3 is minus three, one, one, three. And things are much nicer than the first time when we looked. We don't have to, didn't have to do any scaling the whole way through as we made these calculations. Now, remember what our goal was, to find a QR factorization. So Q is the matrix that's given by the columns, U1, U2, and U3. Those are now orthogonal, but we need to normalize them to make them into unit vectors. Our life is nice here because uh, the length of all of these vectors is the square root of 20, 9 plus 1 plus 1 plus 3. So what we actually just have is this matrix, 3, 1, minus 1, 3, 1, 3, 3, minus 1, minus 3, 1, 1, 3, where every entry has been divided by the square root of 20. Now in general, so this is 1 over the square root of 20 times that entire matrix. In general, these, may, these vectors may have different lengths. So we may have something divided by the square root of 20 for each of these things, maybe divided by the square root of 18 for each of these things. We might have to change each of the columns by a different constant. Uh, but this one works out nicely because each of U1, U2, and U3 already has exactly the same length. So this is Q. Now finally, remember that since A is QR, R is Q inverse A, but since Q is now an orthogonal matrix, Q inverse is Q transpose, so R is just Q transpose times A. Right, and let's actually work this one out by hand and see what we get. 
So here's A. I'm going to put Q transpose up here. Q transpose, remember, just means switch the rows and columns. The so 1 over 20 is still there. 1 over root 20 is still there. When I switch the rows and columns, then I get 3, 1, minus 1, 3. 1, 3, 3, minus 1. I'm just reading these as rows rather than columns. And then minus 3, 1, 3. So this is Q transpose. So if I take Q transpose times A, let's see what we get. Q transpose times A is 1 over the square root of 20 times. If I multiply these out, I get 9, 1, 1, and 9, which is 20. I get uh, negative 15, that makes negative 14, that makes negative 19, and then another negative 21 makes negative 40. This one becomes 3, that makes 4, 6, and 24 makes 30. If we come down here, I get 3 and 3. Uh, so uh, 3 and 3 is 6, minus 3 and minus 3 goes to 0. We come over here, I get negative 5, that makes negative 2, that makes 13, and that makes uh, 7, makes 20. And then finally, on this column, or this row, 1 and 3 makes 4, and negative 6 makes negative 2, and negative 8 makes negative 10. Negative 9, 1, negative 1, and 9 make 0. 15, and 1 is 16, and 5 is 21, and negative 21 is 0. And then negative 3, and 1 is negative 2, and another negative 2 is negative 4, and 24 is, is 20. And so look what we've got. Even when we push this constant through, we do have a matrix which has positive entries on the diagonal and is upper triangular. And so this is our matrix R. Now, this QR factorization has lots of uses uh, in, in application, so it's good to see it and, to, and be exposed to it. We're not going to actually see many of these uses at all. Uh, but this is the idea. We're using this, uh, this Gram-Schmidt process uh, to find this QR factorization, which is actually used in, um, in, in tons and tons of matrix, matrix programs. And this is 6.4, and uh, we're good to go on that section. So I will see you next time where we will actually start looking at Chapter 7.